So, good afternoon, gentlemen. Good um, afternoon. My name is Jeremy, Jeremy Blades. Uh, living here in Liverpool for the past 13 years, so obviously I've heard about the riots, I've, I've read the Wikipedia pages. Obviously, if you, if you the listeners, or the, visit, the viewers, uh, want to know any more information about exactly the, the official way that everything happened, there are videos and things for that. We'll, we'll try and put some links in the in the comments and description for you to do that. But what this is, this is, is more of a, a personal uh, interview about what, what it was like for you in Liverpool at that time. Um, so we'll start with introductions. So we'll start from the, uh, the extreme other side of the table for me. Hi, my name's uh, Albert Fontenot. Um, I was in Liverpool during the eighties um, principally when the riots occurred and during the immediate af- aftermath as well and beforehand. Yeah. Um, my name's Ray Corliss and yeah, I've been around possibly the same amount of time as Albert um, and I've been involved in a whole raft of initiatives in Liverpool late. Um, in terms of like things like social housing and training and always underpinned through um, race equality and diversity. Yeah, and my name's Patrick Graham, and I'm well I'm born and raised in Liverpool, so I remember the build-up to what I will, um, if you don't mind being correct, have called the uprisings rather than riots. Um, I was there before that, Jordan, and obviously I'm still here afterwards. So, yeah. Good. So we know that the uh, the uprising, the, the fortieth anniversary, is is today. Um, so 1981, so take me back to January 1981 for, for you guys. What was, it, what was the, the, the atmosphere before the uprising happened? Like what, I, I know, we know that you know, the police were notoriously heavy-handed, especially with, with black people in the area. But what else was going on? Like what, how, was, how was the community feeling at that point? Like, you specifically. Let's start with Ray. Um, I think in terms of where it was at at that time, I think there was a degree of cohesiveness because of, you know, there was a lot of organisations that were operating in the field of social welfare, um, as well as, you know, issues relative to education, employment and so on. But I think also the condition, I think it was the sort of social conditions at the time which were reflected upon the quality and the standard of living of people. At the same time, you had this historical element of racist police authority in Liverpool late. Um, And then obviously that came to the fore in 1981. But there's a history to that uh, in terms of how we were able to combat issues of that nature. Um, things like the, the Listener article where um, uh, uh, white mothers were being accused of being prostitutes and producing black babies, mixed-race babies. And the community would always respond and react to these issues uh, and having an understanding, a clear understanding of how racist it was. So that was, that was the foundation to what happened in 1981. So, like, Patrick, like, in in your house, let's say, you know, you wake up in the morning, January 1981, what was it like for you specifically? How was it in your family, in your family group? Like, because the community was obviously, you know, galvanizing itself already. Well, um, at that time, I'm not even a teenager, January 1981, I'm just coming up to my teens, so, you know, I had, I was the youngest of um, six of us, you know what I mean? So at that point in time, you know, there was me and older brother and a sister or two living at home. Hmm. So, um, so what, what were your parents, what, were your, what was your, your parents, mother, father, all of those things? Or is it, was it just you and your mom and... Yeah, well, my dad lived local. Okay, yeah. yeah. He was, you know, literally a couple hundred yards away, but we was living under my mum's household at this time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was, again, some of the things Ray said from an oldest perspective, I was aware of that, you know what I mean? Like, 
not as although I was aware of the racial element from the police, I was more aware of the racial element from society at large because that was where I felt the brunt of racism from, you know, from other um, people. You know, I had grew up and, and faced racism from the police, but not on the scale of someone who would have been a bit older, like 15, 16 plus. So being, you know, 11, 12, you're still aware of it because you'd had incidents throughout your life where, you know, a, a police car could pull up literally next to you, wind the window down and call you all types of names and just drive off laughing, you know what I mean? And that's something I've experienced from as long as I can remember from at least five years old and up, you know, and, and, and just after. So, you know... He was aware of all these things, the different tensions, certain places where you just couldn't walk. Because if you did walk, well, you didn't end up walking, you ended up running because you'd definitely be chased because yeah. you just weren't allowed in them areas. And when I say in them areas, I'm not even talking about areas outside of Liverpool. These were some parts of Liverpool Lake itself because Liverpool yeah. Lake's not a massive area, but it's still the, the black community was confined to a smaller area of Liverpool Lake in, in some respects. So there was parts of Liverpool Lake. I remember as a very youngster, the street I lived in, which was off Lodge Lane, was a popular area now and was mm-hmm. then. But I remember our street was racially divided, where the bottom mm-hmm. half was dangerous to go down and the top half was multicultural and, and, and relaxed. So, so Albert, I mean, you know, forgive me, you, you, you're you probably a little bit older than Patrick. So for you... Never. <laughs> so for, a little bit more, but yeah. So for you, like he, he, he explained that you know, he, he experienced these things from the police sp- specifically at 12, 13. What was it like for you? What, what directly, like, how, how were you dealing with life at that point? Well, Patrick's absolutely right to make that observation because even though I'm at least 10 years older than you, aren't I? Yeah. 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 yeah go ahead. I did say at least, Patrick. <laughs> um, I had, had the same experience, just as my mother and father had. Uh, my mother was born here. She still knew what racism was, especially from the police. Um, I, so I've been dealing with it, like Patrick, since I was about seven, eight, or nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I'm seventy three now. So, I mean, it's it's because, as I said, I mean, I I I don't really have a concept. I mean, in Bermuda, we had uprisings here and there, um, but I at the time I would have been about one or two. So, you know, for for you, Ray. Like further on in the in the months that came up to it, like we know that uh, the reason it actually kicked off was because of the the heavy handed arrest of a of a gentleman. Yeah, and we were you there for that? No, or? no, I yeah. wasn't there. But I think going back to what Patrick's saying and all, I think you got to look at the narrative of what was going on because you know two years prior to um, the uprisings in eighty one. Margaret Thatcher was elected yep. to government in 1979. But that didn't reflect upon the fact that the police were still racist. So in many respects, a lot of people go down the road of Thatcher, Thatcher, Thatcher. But that stays at the back of the queue because the police were always had this attitude towards black people in yep. Liverpool. I mean, people used to get set up. By, you know, people used to get set up by putting things in the pockets and then getting arrested on the spot. Lenny Cruikshank, for example, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and it was, these things just went on and on and on. And so in Liverpool Lace, you were accustomed to them being racist. You understood that they were racist. You knew that if you were going to get a pull, you didn't have to be outside the Liverpool Lace. They'd pull you on Granby. Yeah. They'd pull you on Mulgrave Street. they pull you on the Avenue. They'll pull you anywhere because that was how they were. They felt they could do whatever they wanted at that particular time. And obviously what happened, you know, 3rd of July, that was the reaction which which was necessary yeah. for people, to for, for the police to understand and the authorities to understand that the black community was not going to take it any further and we're not going to accept it any further. This is where we drew the line and the line was drawn on Catherine Street and the police were pushed, pushed further down Parliament Street. And that was the response. That was the reaction. Enough was enough. We're not having any of this anymore. So that was that was what happened. And the response from Kenneth Oxford, the chief constable, was not one of um, acceptance of the circumstances. He just basically went, went on 
just come on arrows like the ball out of the china shop he just mm. went for everyone mm. he didn't want any sort of understanding of why this had all occurred he just referred to the black community as criminals yeah up between so, negroes yeah. that's basically <laughs> the attitude wasn't it so how dare you be up between so the the uprising begins what what are you guys doing like you know, you said you wasn't there when it, it started, but did you did you go out onto the streets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I went there on. I think I went there on the Sunday night, um, because I had a family, small family. Yeah. But I went there on the Sunday nights, and on the Sunday nights, it was just the control of your like of the uprising were in the hands of the people who were on the front line, because the police were being pushed back further and further back. You could go onto Parliament Street, down to. Um, the Rackets Club, which was on fire, and next door was the the, the Princess Park Hospital, where there was a, a row of taxis taking the elderly people out of the Princess Park Hospital, which was being organised by the people on the front line, you know, and then also people, what I witnessed as well, was people outside having a drink outside the Glad Ray, you know, because that's the way it was, and... Also, injured people being taken from the front line on the backs of um, milk floats up to Sefton General, yeah. up to Parliament Street, down Smith Down Road, which was which was controlled by the traffic was controlled by those people on the front line again. You know that's how it would occurred. People were in control, and you know I, that was the whole process of people then saying enough is enough. You know what I mean? We're in control of these these circumstances now. We're in control of what goes on in this particular area. And that was what was happening with, you know, the decanting of the um, elderly patients out of Princess Park whilst the rackets was on fire mm. and people were going into the rackets and taking stuff out, furniture, paintings and whatever else, um, whilst the police were being battered on the front line. <laughs> so, Albert, where, where were you? Did you get involved directly or were you...? Yeah, the... Um I was the principal of the Charles Button Centre at the time, when I think about it. I had been for all just on a year. Um, so t- tell me about the Charles Wooden Centre. Yeah, it, it was, an, it was a, a black organisation that was in the business of locating training and employment opportunities for, uh, for black adults. Um, mainly as a remedy to the disastrous education they'd received as children and pupils and whatever else of the Liverpool education system. So, so obviously you would have seen people you knew on the front line controlling things, and and so as as a as a head of this organisation, what 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 did you start thinking at that point? I I, I was too busy putting, <laughs> putting out. They set fire to the... Um, no, they hadn't set fire. The building next door had been set on fire. and It, it was in grave danger of burning down the Charles Wharton Centre. So myself and Louis Julien um, had commandeered the fire brigade's hose pipes <laughs> and were putting out the building next door before it burned down our own building. So that's and So I'm standing here and the, the fighting is going on where you are. <laughs> oh, wow. So I'm, when I say fighting, I'm talking about fighting, really. Yeah. Terrific fighting, yeah. Well, that, that, wasn't that caught on camera, you guys trying to um, put the fire out? I believe it yeah. was, yeah. I, I, I'd be surprised if it wasn't. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Some it was. news footage floating around. I'm not was. sure which channel, but yeah. there's a clip on one of the Granada news or the other Granada news. So... So the, the riots went on for, was it nine days or seven days? 80s. Yeah. The 1980s. Yeah. The whole, the, 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 the uprising that happened yeah. that we were talking about. So it went on for yeah. like three nights at the beginning. Yeah, of at the beginning. The right. Through. And it was, if, if I remember right, because again, you know, it is 40 years ago now. It was the, the, the first kickoff because I, re- I remember the incident with the motorbike and all that because I was a little kid at the time. I lived on the estate where it was happening, just so on the d- edge of the d- estate. And you know, I can recall bits and bobs. I couldn't see that much because I was mm. too small. Yeah, in a crowd of a lot of people, you know what I mean. But I know the police were there. They'd stop someone again, which was a common occurrence. So mm. there was nothing 
strange in that, you know what I mean? But mm. it was, when, when you recollect and think back, you think, oh, there is something slightly different about this because there was a, a greater number of people and they gathered quicker than they normally gather. You know, this was without social media, without mobile phones, but just quick word of mouth, someone might make one phone call. That's all I needed. And, and you know, and just words travels and people just yeah. homed in. And that, you know, there's a lot of shouting, a lot of shoving and pushing, you know what I mean? Maybe the odd blow got thrown, et cetera. And, and then that was it. That was the, 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 the straw. That incident was the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say. And then from there, but then, you know, once night time set in, yeah. the, the sun went down. Yeah, that, that's that's an, another thing I'd like to people came out to, to um, intervene. The, the myth that it was um, just to the residents of Liverpool Eight, because on the second day of the riots, my cousin called for me while I was cooking my dinner. Um, we went for a, a drive around Liverpool Eight, and we noticed that there was crowds of people on the main art road. Or, arteries of Liverpool 8 so we followed the crowd and the crowds were coming from miles away and what it demonstrated was that a whole heap of people in Liverpool had a problem with the police this was their opportunity to vent their anger at that and so there was thousands of white people more so than black people really yeah, but I'm can sorry. I can make, make a point there? The white people wouldn't have been there if black people hadn't yeah, stayed there. Right, because right. I, I, I did I did when I when I asked that is like no. you know I since I've moved to Liverpool I've I've noticed that this city galvanizes regardless. It's like you know we're Liverpool. We don't really care about anybody else if necessary. Mm-hmm. If you don't like one guy from Liverpool, it doesn't matter if he's white, black, purple. We will defend him. So. Did you feel that almost immediately when when things kicked off, or well, was yeah, it because when you've got police wherever they are, whether it be Liverpool, Liverpool Lakes, or anywhere in the world, as a matter of fact, you know, whether it be in parts of America, parts of countries in Africa, police are very authoritarian, and they're in, they represent the governments of them ruling states in, in every country, and they brutalise just about everybody. You know, we get it doubly worse because we're black, so they give, there's a racial element to it. But as, as, as Ray and Albert pointed out, the white people came in on support because they were getting brutalised by the police, not through race, and not as a big a grievance as us. Our was grievance was race at the top of everything else. Yeah. You know, I, I can recall coaches coming in, which, you know, understand at the time, but, you know, from heightened people that organised coach loads to come down, you know, at, 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 you know as the evening was setting in to, to, to join in as they said, to vent their anger against yeah. the police. So when people try and call it a race riot, rather than an, it was an uprising against police oppression from whole sections yeah. of society, yeah. you know, started by the black community because we took the brunt of that oppression for racial reasons and every other reason, mm. social and class reasons and so forth. You know, um, it wasn't a race riot from the collective point of view of the people on the streets or the racial uprising. It was an uprising against the police. As black people, we were involved for racial reasons because, as I said, we're feeling the brunt of that racism and being called, you know, white guys didn't get, you know, they got harassed on the street, but not because of the colour. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and not extra things and worse. So, uh, what I feared as a youngster is the stories that I knew of older people, 16, 17 plus, being picked up with no reason, not arrested, and just driven to certain parts of the city and let outside of a pub that might be notorious for racism and then yeah. have to run the gauntlet to get back to Liverpool late. Yeah. I feared that as a youngster, that that's yeah. going to soon happen to me. I'm going to come of age where I'm going to be after put up with Ray, that. And that was terrifying. Ray, you were going to say something earlier. <laughs> uh, I've, I've probably <laughs> lost track of it. Um, no, but I think just on, on, on the point of, you know what happened afterwards as well a few days later yeah in park road there was a there was a copycat smaller version of a riot i think a few days after mm-hmm. uh, it might have been a week yeah. later because i remember the quick save being sort of attacked and other shops on park road so that was in the white district of liverpool like just over the border from yeah princess road and lodge lane uh, and, lodge lane. and yeah. there was one in lodge lane as well yeah. Um, th- uh, which happened again several days after the initial riots as well because also at the same time 
post period in the first few days afterwards. I mean, you've never seen so many police officers ever in terms of the numbers of co coach loads that were marching up and down Windsor Street, you know, yeah. um, just in file. And they'd come in from East Lancashire, North Lancashire, Yorkshire, the West Wales. Midlands, Wales. There must have, there were several thousand of them that weren't connected to Liverpool. And that was to keep the peace on the streets. And that was like, that was like a week later. Yeah. That was a week later. I mean, on the Monday afterwards, I remember being in Huskisson Street when it was calm, it was calm, down, it had calmed down. And I was with some friends in the flat in Huskisson Street and I left there because I lived up Windsor Street. And as I was walking down Windsor Street, I had to avoid these sort of, there must have been several hundred of them, police officers marching down Windsor Street, getting off coaches. And, like, they would, would they just get they off? The they were there to then retain yeah. whatever level of peace there was then. Right. But people came out on Mondays and Tuesdays on, 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 on Parliament Street attacking the police. Yeah. Um, and that's how you then moved into that whole sort of sphere of the police then responding in the manner in which they did when they murdered David Moore. Yeah, you know, it's no question it was a murder. They crushed them, deliberately crushed them, and when it came to identifying a who was driving the van and b the van, the police van, it took them six weeks. Yeah, I mean, I I did hear about that, and uh, what I what I discovered is that this is a tactic that the police had learned from from Ireland and yeah. the, the the troubles that they were having there. And they'd used it in. You I think see, used it in, in, for the first time in the, in in the, the mainland UK. UK. Exactly. Um, and who were the boys who. Do you remember the boy, the photograph of the boy with the big hole in his chest? There's a few people. Yeah. Ken, yeah. Ken, Ken Cooper. Yeah, Ken Cooper. Did it, sure. was and he, he was a guy who wasn't involved in the riots. Oh. He liked to drink. But he, he was known to know the local police and that. And, you yeah. know, he's staggering along the road and they just literally. He's just an easy target. They just shot him there, killed him. You know, um, and, and it's funny you, when you mentioned the amount of police, because I remember, you know, going to school in the aftermath of that, literally yeah. every day you got your pee bag searched and whatever. And it was effectively an occupying force. Yeah. An, an, an occupation of, of that's another That's another question. Yeah. Where the amount you know, of, you know, there was, in any one street, there could be one, 200 police in yeah. groups of 20, you know, 50 yards apart, all marching, yeah. one's going that way, one's coming that way, another's coming this way, and they're just everywhere. It was an yeah. occupying force, So basically. So, so what was your like? You said you had a young family at the time. Yeah. Like, what was your, what were they doing? Where were we? Oh, they were. They were I mean, young family as yeah. in two year olds, three year olds. So I mean, they were just. I mean, they were just part of the family situation. So, you know, so, you just had to keep them away from that sort of scenario. So how did you? You know, I mean, I'm sure there was noise and things like that. How did you? How did you deal with that family aspect of it? It's. You know, I don't know, as I said, I don't know if you were out and whatever, but, like, when you came home, you know, how did you, you know, was your was your partner involved as well? Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, everybody was yeah, involved. Everybody was yeah. involved. So, you know, what, what happened with the with these young children? Like, who who was taking, who who held them while you guys came out? Uh, was was the, the grandparents, were they? Were no, they my, my partner held on, to, well, looked after my children while yeah. I went out and, had to look what was going on and sort of like to survey the scene yeah. and the landscape of what was happening because there was smoke billowing from buildings like the Rialto building and um, the Rackets Club and and on a lots of noise yeah. of banging on shields. Yeah. And this was the people on the front line who were taking the, the shields off the police <laughs> and went out taunting the police yeah. by banging on the shields and you could hear it. You could hear the bang in half a mile away. Yeah, and where we lived at the time, we were literally in the in right in the middle of it yeah. almost yeah. because where our house was from Parliament Street is twenty yards, thirty yards yeah. from Parliament Street. So yeah. you know the riots and battles, running battles, mm -hmm. taking place right outside mm -hmm. our front door, basically with the police as well as twenty yards away on Parliament Street itself, which is the main battleground. And what what was ironic what I remember because I remember writing a poem to, some years later, I think after like the twenty year anniversary, and uh, one of the lines that I had in it, it was such and such was the battleground, there was plenty of designer bricks all around. 
or place to be found because if you remember rightfully they was doing up certain sections of Parliament Street yeah. and there was big mounds of, of, of bricks yeah yeah you know I mean? there yeah, was yeah. Big mounds of bricks six seven foot high dotted right along Parliament Street so you know there was design of bricks you know there for, for, for the the, the, the people in, in, involved and I'll, I'll never forget that yeah. so ammunition you mean yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so Ray, Ray said uh, uh, Patrick was talking about how he had to go to school. You know, almost right after it. Like, what, what did you have to go? Were you working at the time, or were you? I had to. Yeah, we never closed. Yeah, Charles Rutten never closed for about a month. Yeah, and did it? Was well, yeah. day? Well, it was. The, I mean, you you need to explain the role of the Charles Rutten here. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. The the, the Charles Rutten was. Become almost overnight the premier um, black organisation in HQ. the area. HQ. In yeah. fact, and people use it as a HQ, and I was quite happy for it to be used as a HQ by various groups, but mainly groups that were involved in the in the resistance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And I can remember all night meetings between concerned people. Yeah. Um, so to be a, a um, did we we, we organise uh, people to go and visit people who'd been arrested and, and transported to Risley, which is a remand centre about twenty five miles north of, well, east of Liverpool. Um, so we, we you know I can remember um, coaches being organised for people to go and visit them. That kind of stuff was going on, but it was also deep thinking as well going on there was um, we, we come up with the idea of um, a, an urban development company which was taken from us by the way <laughs> taken from us and applied to Liverpool City's waterfront the Albert Dock the is, Albert Dock is that when uh, the, the politician came in the environmental yeah has, yeah. has, a, has a sign yeah and Captain but has I a think sign. I think going back to the role of Charles Rutten, and I think Albert's being very sort of laissez-faire with his <laughs> with, with the role that he played because it was the heartbeat in terms of um, what was it's coming out of there in terms of political, uh, activity. political activity, political resistance, and also Liverpool Late Defence Committee. Yeah, and that was the mainstay in terms of you know uh, the the role of the, that was the Charles Rutten was playing at that particular time. Um, because it was, you know, the defence committee basically, and you were you were a member of it. You know, it was a question of like, there's there's no compromise, there's no compromise whatsoever, and that was how it remained, and that was how staunch the the response was and the reaction was to what happened over that weekend was the formation of the Liverpool Eight Defence Committee, which took on then the mantle of the issues with the establishment and the authorities from 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 a criminal justice perspective and a legal perspective that was the role that they played yeah, yeah. so uh, and that that in itself was controversial the okay, decision I can imagine. to <laughs> the, the decision to uh, address non police issues um some people perceived that the the reasons that the police could pick on us was because they'd observed we had no power, so yeah. they could do what they want. There was no, there was no retribution. There was no consequence to it, except maybe one of them might get a punch in the face now and again. Yeah. But, in like, term, but in terms of being able to spy who had power and who didn't, the people who lived in Liverpool Eight went demonstrably without power. Yeah, and um, some of us elected to attack the police, may sustain that attack after the um, uprisings. And some of us got on the economic effects of that. And uh, so there was always that tension as well between people who just wanted to attack the police, rightly so, and people who wanted to say, well, where's our piece of them? Okay. The action. Yeah. 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 So, so you know, so because we're coming down to like about five minutes or so, I would like to get to like it's forty years later, right? And I would be really curious as to like 
what you gentlemen feel about as time changed, especially what we just had gone through last year with George Floyd and 50 states of Black Lives Matter rising. Again, we're still going through the situation, so we're really like trying to yeah. get to the... That, that was, that was going to be my next question. It's like, so, Ray, you, you said you, you've been working in social justice and these sorts of things. Was that the point for you, or was it before that? Before and, that. Before. Right, before so, that, you see, the thing, one of the things is, and I will yeah. come on to that in a minute, Chase. One of the things that, when we got to 1981, and we were able to confront the authorities and the establishments in the manner mm. in which we did by strategizing and formulating policy and how we were going to approach and so on and so forth. People thought we just turned up. We'd yeah. done our apprenticeships yeah. 10 years before where we started as youngsters. And we'd come through these 10 years to then understand that what we can take control of and what we can deliver and what we can... We wanted everything. Also be influential and be impactful yeah. upon people and see people to see us, not as role models, but look, if we can do it, you can do it, right? Yeah. Because the, we were standing on the shoulders of other people, you know, from back in the day and from what we learned as a result of, you know, coming through as young teenagers and recognising the Black Panthers, recognising Martin Luther King, lots of stuff going on around you even in the context of the community that you lived in, it was reflected of what was going on in the States. So we brought that with us, and that was part of how we were able to confront these issues and be sort of understanding of them, and at the same time, be responsible for your actions. You know, because that's where we were coming from at that time. Yeah. We were just forceful because we'd had enough. We yeah. weren't prepared to take anything any further from the establishment. It was as if... The metaphor was like, you know, we got, we, we hid the petrol bombs, right? Mm. And we donned the suits and the tie and we started negotiating. That's the only way I can basically put it. Yeah. You know, that was how it was. They began to understand where we came from. But if you come back to the present day and say 40 years later, have things changed? <laughs> no, I don't think they have. Because when George Floyd happened last year and everybody was really joyful about the response and the reaction, I said to people, Not just again. look, you know, I've been here before. You know, I would like to see your favour in six months' time. Six yeah. months' time, I don't see them people. So, I mean, let's, let's go back a little bit before, like before George Floyd. There were, there were riots in England, yeah. um, 2000 and, I can't remember, 12, yeah. There's a history yeah. of riots in Liverpool right. from 1919, so, 1948, 1972, and 1981. So, and 1985 it, as well. People you know, always forget in 1985. I think it was in the October of that year. There was a, 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 a couple of nights of, of, of riots uh, uprising so, in Liverpool. Because even, even, even after all these periods that, that we're talking about, um, you know, I can remember as I became a teenager and a young teen, and some of the, the things they're talking about with the guys in the suits and that, that still had to be accompanied by protest as well. And, and sometimes buildings were occupied, you know, council buildings, offices were occupied, yep. pickets yep. outside, you know, e e e even the courts, you know what I mean? I can remember the courts mm -hmm. being taken over, the magistrates' yep. courts, yep. where, you know, hundreds of people managed to get into the courts and take over the building. And when we came out, it was like, wow, there was like, maybe thousands of people outside and you just didn't believe there was that many people, you know, and the raptures and the cheers that went up and all these different issues were going on. So, you know, things run at a <coughs> point alongside one supported the other. Yeah, yeah, you did need to sit down and be diplomatic and be you had to have back up. but you still needed that that vocal protest as well. You so know, not in the form of the up physical uprising, but in the form of a, a positive action and going into offices and occupying them and saying, well, if, if yous aren't going to work for everyone, then no work's getting done today because this office is being taken over and no one's going to be allowed to do anything unless it benefits everybody rather than just to select you. So yeah. as, as you said, I mean, you don't think anything's changed. I mean, you know, no, no, we, can, we can see. But what do you think it's going to take to make any real change? Can I just answer that quickly? I know I've just spoken. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, to, to, to make a lot of change, like... It's just an example where, you know, someone whose who's child's going through racism at a school at the moment and, and the teacher is basically offering 
to, to, to bring some type of what they call the black issue. They, they actually use that term, the black and yeah. How's a child race and racism a black issue for the child? That's a white problem and it's them who needs to get the house in order it's them who need to stop being racist it's yeah. them who need to stop being oppressive it's not us who have to stop you know what i mean they need to educate and stop doing what they're doing we can help that process but ultimately it's it, the ball's in their court it's, it's not for us we can't change their mindset they've got to work to change their own mindset and accept and see that they're wrong because things have changed in certain ways materially and the point of, you know, we've got a brilliant Albert Dock all built up, it looks all great, but did that benefit the community that the monies that was used to build that up come from? No, it didn't. People didn't get jobs there. People couldn't even afford to shop there. You know what I mean? And it's still similar to this day. Yeah. You know what I mean? You go into the city centre, black faces are very scarce, <coughs> so on and so on. So, you know, there's black youths, you know, still see the complaints of people getting stopped and harassed for no reason, you know, beaten up and, and, and whatnot. You know, the scale of it could be slightly different, but it's still going on, and there's progress. But when, it's like what Malcolm X says, when a guy sticks a knife in me back six inches, and he pulls it out four inches, you know, <laughs> yeah. people are calling that progress, but the knife's still in your back, you know, yeah. even if you take it out fully, have they treated the wound? No. So, you know, there's all these different elements to these things. So, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and um, white society needs to look at itself and address its issues, and, because it's their and issues you, that cause us a, 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 a massive problem. Do you think that happened after the after the Black Lives Matter things of, of last year? Do you think that, that more white people are looking at what they as white people have done or can do, or the way they think? Do you think that's changed I, at all? I think then? it's changed yeah. positively. I think it's changed. Uh, I, I resent the fact that I'm still waiting for change from... 30 years later. 30 years, is it? 40. 40. <laughs> and See, I like to think... I, re I resent that part. Yeah. But if I have to... If, if you force me to confront it, I have to say things have changed in terms of the white people's attitude. Although the change is twofold. Reasonably, reasonable people acknowledge that they have to do something about their behaviour. The unreasonable ones, it's it's just a confirmation to them of how they should behave in a, a bad way. Yeah. And, and do, you, do you think this, this, this current generation of young people, do you, do you see any change, in like, any difference between the makeup of... Yeah, yeah there is, there is a, you know, there's... The way they responded last year and the way they've continued to respond for probably the last 12 months in terms of, you know, young white people. Mm -hmm. That's been, I think, the significant point over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. And they see it more so than their elder brothers and sisters in the 25s, 30 age group. But the younger ones in the, the, the 15 to 20 age group, they see it, they understand it, they get it. Mm. They've been probably part of it, and I think in that respect that it's we have to understand as well. I mean, we d we don't say that white white people think that the black people think they're the enemy. They're not, because you know we go to school with them. They're part of our communities, grown up with them, and they're also part of our families. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So does that, which really. In the general context of, of racism, a lot of racists, you know, have that view of black people. We are the enemy. Yeah. That's how they see it. They don't see it anything in any other way than you are the enemy for the reasons of the colour of your skin. And that's the way it has always been. And that narrative has always filtered through from the, from the transatlantic slavery days right through to the present day. And that's why I always stop and think and say to people, just take a step back, come back in three months or six months' time and let's see if the same favour and let's see if the same attitudes are there. We only have to look at taking the knee with the footballers now, you know. <laughs> I was going to you know, bring that up. You know, people say, well, you know, just because they boo it, they're not racist. Well, if they're not racist, what are they? <laughs> yeah. What are they if they're not racist? Yeah. And then at the same time, when Raheem Sterling puts the ball in the back of the net, those same racists throw their hands in the air. 
Stats? Because I was going to bring that up. I mean, it's after the last game. Double standards, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, after the last after the last game, uh, Raheem Sterling obviously has been doing very well in the Euros. Um, and Harry Kane hasn't, for whatever reason. Harry Kane scores one goal and is all over the front the front pages of the newspaper. So, you know, how does and that... And Raheem Sterling was... Someone took a photograph of him with his daughter from the stands in there. Yeah. And then the newspapers were that embarrassed that they then had to do it the next day because yeah. somebody in social media had taken a photograph on the stands yeah. of his young daughter and Raheem with his hands out to her. But yeah. that photograph would never have appeared because it was taken by somebody in the stands and not, but, not the photographers who were official there yeah. to take the photographs of Harry Kane. Yeah. yeah, it was Harry Kane's anti. And, the, and, and then any photographs they did take, they, they, as usual, they don't use them. They're just discarded. Yeah. Because ju- just to add on to the points what they were saying about the young people getting it and so forth, and I'm talking about in the UK and America yeah. and, and, and globally under the Black Lives Matter banner, is years ago when you had what you would call civil rights movements, mm-hmm. it was predominantly all black people. You know, there was white people involved, but yeah. very minimal. Yeah. Where now you just start to just about everybody out there on the streets recognising the issue. You know, some of the images that I've seen from um, America were really um, really great images because it was, there'd be times where the priests were ready to just go and get into the, all, the, all the black protesters and, and they would shout, um, I can't remember the exact term, but they, shout, but they shouted something like white defence or white line. Yeah. And a group white of white mothers would just stand and place themselves in front of the police. I, and I say, have well, a friend that... If you want to beat them, you're going to have to beat through us. And the police straight away would just would just be pacified immediately. Yeah. And that, that was that was really lovely to see, you know what I mean? Because that's, that's called unity, that's called... Um, respect and understand the Black Lives Matter, not going to shout, no, all lives matter, which is a nonsense statement. Yeah. <laughs> we know all lives matter, but obviously if black lives aren't part of that, then all lives don't matter to the authorities that are in question. So yeah. I don't need to explain it to, you know, yeah, was, yeah. ultimately, you know, for people out there, because there's going to be people listening to this saying, no, all lives do matter, then, you know, just... Of course. All get lives never program. mattered until black lives mattered. Exactly. Get with the program. This is the thing. I mean, when a house is on fire... You put that house out. You don't put next doors out on the grounds. Well, the house is important. <laughs> that's put a out good the house on fire. Obviously, and yeah. And when that's dealt with, you can then look to see if there's any issue with next door. But, yeah. Well, it's been a it's been a in incredibly useful conversation, especially for me as a as a, like I like to call myself an import. Um, Outside of we call it. <laughs> well, <laughs> <Far enough>. uh, <laughs> technically, technically, yes. Uh, before yeah. I, probably uh, voted for Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> I was born and raised here, and I've been told many times can, to go back where you come from. We can, can, say, well, I'm from down the road. Yeah, so, we can know. we can talk about all those things for another mm-hmm. few hours, but yeah. you know, we'd like to wrap it up. Nice to nice to meet you guys again. It's been a pleasure um, being here. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I hope to uh, uh, what, what you're endeavouring to do. Turns out to be wildly successful. Yeah, I mean, as so this is only the first uh, yeah, I was, for the Liverpool Black Minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was, I was gonna say this is. Yeah, this is this is definitely uh, this is this is a, a new thing that uh, we as a group of black men in Liverpool have gotten together, and this is the first podcast in a series that we hope to produce. Um, hopefully, we'll have them out fairly regularly, and that's our plan at the moment. So. Again, thanks a lot, guys. It's been great. And hopefully we'll get you back in and talk about some other things yeah. and maybe some some happier times, yep. <laughs> you know. Yeah, definitely, Good. because there's so much to talk about. You there know, is, from yes. yeah. Uprisings to art and creativity yeah. to employment. And yeah, to, to art and creativity. See, to, to art and crea- creativity in, in the digital setup is took off big time, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, as I think so anyway. So we'll do we'll definitely do a so. we're definitely gonna be doing a lot more and look yeah. out for us. Yeah. But don't you think it's it's so popular this last year? I'm so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, man. No. See we you're too, yeah. we're, you're too good, you see. We're, 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 the audience, the audience, the outside the audience get getting in, the in on the on the things. <laughs> so, you know, look out for what we're doing. Um we have a Facebook group, but we'll we look out for our Instagram as well. You'll see our, our logos and things up. And, yeah, thanks a lot for listening. Thanks a lot for coming, watching us. These guys are amazing. If you Thank see you. them in the street, make sure you say hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you.